Uh, well, first off, I wanted to uh, thank the organizers for uh, uh, this uh, wonderful opportunity to share with you uh, the work that I've been pursuing now for um, uh, almost eight years, uh, describing uh, novel risk factors in neurodegenerative uh, disorders. Um, the, the topic today, uh, the co-occurrence of autoimmune diseases uh, within atypical dementias, um, uh, sort of a common theme yesterday was uh, a lot of the speakers were, were wanting to go uh, beyond uh, the, the titles, and uh, uh, in this case, uh, I'm going to do the same, that uh, uh, this is really part two of a two-part talk. Uh, the story for me um, uh, really begins with uh, neurodevelopment uh, and its impact um, in the atypical uh, dementias, uh, that essentially, uh, I think, how you're built matters. Um, but uh, my own story, my own journey uh, into neuroscience is uh, really uh, um, uh, based on uh, these three individuals. Uh, beginning with uh, Norman Geshwin, the father of uh, behavioral neurology, who really sort of taught me that um, uh, uh, how we are built matters, that we're all on a, a kind of a spectrum, uh, that there are dynamic tensions uh, between uh, left and right-sided uh, 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 cognitive uh, brain functions, front and back, dorsal, ventral, uh, and, and it's typified by the example of uh, hemispheric dominance, hand preference, um, uh, I am not right-handed, I am left-handed, it's the terminology that I use, and I uh, wonder if a uh, show of hands, uh, uh, anybody else in the audience uh, uh, left-handed or with me? Excellent. Um, so, you know, usually uh, with um, uh, left-handedness, it's about 10% uh, of uh, the general population is uh, non-right-handed, non-right-handed, uh, so if you're ambidextrous, if you're ever f uh, forced to be right-handed, or if you're left-handed, um, you're all counted uh, or considered by me uh, to be left-handed. Uh, usually in uh, behavioral neurology neuroscience audiences, it's more than 10%. Uh, in the Memory and Aging Center, uh, in my uh, fellowship class, uh, we were um, uh, more than 50%. Uh, uh, there's uh, associations with um, uh, uh, differences in brain symmetry, uh, and then reports on uh, selective uh, differences in, in cognitive abilities, uh, potentially musical giftedness, uh, artistic giftedness, mathematical abilities, uh, but also uh, potentially difficulties with um, language learning disabilities uh, and potentially with immune disorders. Uh, and together, this was something that uh, uh, Norman Geshwin, uh, uh, the geshwin behan galberta hypothesis, um, uh, some of his most controversial work, uh, but also uh, uh, very, very interesting to me. Um, uh, next, we have uh, Samir Zeki, a, uh, a famous uh, neuroscientist um, who was really interested in, in the visual arts, uh, the visual brain, um, a father of this concept of neuroaesthetics, uh, and really felt that um, uh, the quote here, uh, the artist, in a sense, is a neuroscientist, and uh, goes on to say, you know, because all art obeys the laws of the visual brain, is not uncommon for art to reveal these laws to us, uh, and this is a great segue to uh, Dr. Bruce Miller, uh, my mentor, and uh, I, I like to joke that uh, when he's happy with me, he calls me his son. Um, but uh, uh, Dr. Miller really sort of um, uh, took uh, this concept that uh, Samir Zeki had uh, and, and moved it forward uh, by showing that uh, not just visual artists telling us something about the brain, uh, but that uh, the patients that he was seeing with frontotemporal dementia uh, were developing these new onset interests uh, in the visual arts. Um, uh, preoccupied, really driven to visual stimuli. In this case, uh, uh, this is an individual with, uh, I believe, uh, had uh, FTD um, uh, ALS and uh, may have been a C9 carrier, um, uh, and, and had some prominent uh, semantic uh, involvement. Uh, and you can see that the kinds of uh, artistry that uh, uh, individuals who had semantic uh, involvement oftentimes took on these really bold, garish, uh, bright uh, uh, contrasting colors, um, and in contrast to uh, another patient they described, uh, where prior to uh, the disease, um, uh, this individual was an artist, um, and, and very staid, classical um, uh, Asian art, uh, and then 13 years into this uh, disorder, uh, this individual had non-fluent primary progressive aphasia, um, the artwork uh, really took on this, uh, uh, I thought, fascinating, sort of haunting, um, sort of cubist uh, breakdown. And so we see this, that, that uh, our patients are teaching us something about uh, the visual brain and visual uh, expression. Um, and uh, we've documented uh, these cases uh, over many years in visual arts and in verbal uh, creativity. Um, 
Uh, real briefly, uh, this audience, I think, is an expert now on, on what the frontotemporal dementias are. Uh, you have uh, a behavioral syndrome and then two language variants. Um, the behavioral syndrome, uh, the underlying pathology can be challenging to predict. Um, a, a right uh, anterior cingulate uh, insular uh, disorder. Uh, the non-fluent syndrome, uh, almost uh, sort of uh, at times a kind of a mirror image uh, of the behavioral variant uh, uh, left inferior opercular, um, uh, tends to be a little bit better uh, in terms of clinical to pathological correlation, uh, at least um, in North America, uh, uh, mostly tau, uh, less TDP, um, uh, but in, in European cases, uh, sometimes more TDP than tau. Uh, and then uh, last, uh, maybe my favorite, uh, uh, the semantic variant, uh, primary progressive aphasia, uh, very, very unique um, uh, anatomical involvement, in this case, the typical left-sided, uh, but can be uh, right-sided first, uh, and, and almost always uh, underlying TDP um, uh, uh, disease, uh, almost always underlying TDP type C uh, disease. In our hands, uh, somewhere around 85% uh, uh, or more of our semantic variant are uh, uh, FTD, uh, FTLD, TDP type C, uh, and an additional uh, uh, portion are, um, uh, uh, tend to be type B. So uh, what did we know about uh, risk factors uh, for uh, frontotemporal dementia? Well, beyond the obvious uh, genetic risk factors, um, uh, frontotemporal dementia being uh, one of the most heritable of uh, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, not much was known in terms of environmental um, uh, risk factors. A paper in 2003, uh, when I started uh, investigating uh, risk factors in frontotemporal dementia had um, uh, suggested that potentially head trauma, and they had shown that that was uh, possibly significantly elevated in, in FTD populations, uh, and potentially thyroid disease, uh, but it didn't reach uh, statistical significance. Um, and then uh, my first project uh, coming to the Memory and Aging Center uh, under uh, Dr. Miller, I wanted to study these semantic variant, these, these language patients who developed new onset creativity. Uh, and so he said, great, uh, let's write a book chapter together on art and dementia. Uh, and so I studied all of the field, read all of the articles, and came across uh, this one uh, footnote, almost uh, a, a single sort of lonely sentence in uh, one of uh, the discussions of his paper, uh, papers uh, that said uh, of the patients that they were studying, of the 12 that they were studying, uh, four were left-handed. And again, I'm left-handed. That, that is very, very strange. It's, it's an, a tremendous over-representation. Uh, and so I thought, well, maybe there's something here. It goes on to say, well, maybe something about their development, brain asymmetries and the like, um, maybe this predisposed them uh, to develop these, these talents. And so I wondered, uh, well, could this be more generalizable? Uh, could neurodevelopment be significant for uh, neurodegenerative diseases? Uh, and so in 2009, I, I began on this sort of crazy project to document um, different features of past medical history of our patients, starting with hand preference. And, and what did I find? Uh, nothing. I found that when I looked at all of our cases in our database, 10% uh, of the entire population was uh, not right-handed. Uh, so I, I dug a little bit deeper. I, I tried to see, well, what about our Alzheimer's cases? Again, nothing, about 10%. Uh, FTD, 10%. Um, and then, you know, PPA, um, uh, 10%. But um, I wouldn't be here if I, if I only found nothing. Uh, what we found is when uh, we, we uh, divided up our uh, PPA uh, um, uh, subjects into their subtypes, uh, something that um, uh, Dr. Bruce Miller uh, and, and my co-mentor, Dr. Mary Lou Gorno-Tempini, always felt it was uh, a, a crucial uh, that you place your bets when you see an individual who has primary progressive aphasia, it's not good enough. Uh, you need to, to try and characterize it as, is it a semantic variant, a non-fluent variant, or a logopenic variant, or, or NOS? Uh, but we really tried to um, uh, avoid that um, uh, so as to, to really try and understand these disorders. And, and sure enough, uh, the semantic variant primary progressive aphasia group in this collection had almost twice the amount of non-right-handedness of the general population. Um, and so um, uh, when we talk about primary progressive aphasias, uh, you know, I really feel like this is the, the disease that you want to study. I, it, to me, it sort of uh, offers uh, the opportunity um, to cure or understand all neurodegenerative diseases. It's like a, a Rosetta Stone of neurodegenerative diseases because uh, each is attacking a different anatomy within the language network. 
um, and then each is associated with underlying, uh, different underlying pathologies. In this case, uh, uh, the numbers are taken here from uh, a colleague, uh, Edu Spinelli, um, uh, his paper um, uh, looking at the underlying pathologies of our PPA cohort, taking out um, our uh, known genetic uh, carriers, so only sporadic individuals. Uh, but 100% of, of the logopenics, uh, sporadic logopenics, were um, uh, beta amyloid positive. 88% um, uh, of our non-fluents were uh, tau positive, uh, and 83% uh, in this case, I think I said 85% before, um, were uh, TDP type C. Uh, and then I had this uh, kind of uh, these findings that suggested maybe there were unique neurodevelopmental backgrounds, and, and of course part two of my talk, uh, possibly uh, unique uh, inflammatory profiles. And so we'll get into that later, but um, what does it mean to be left-handed, right-handed? Um, uh, well, I, I think right-handers are imbalanced. Uh, lefties are more symmetrical, uh, and in this case, um, uh, in particular, uh, the largest uh, difference that you see between a left-handed individual and a right-handed individual are um, uh, uh, asymmetries in the temporal uh, planum, uh, with the right-handed individual having, uh, again, greater asymmetry. Um, and so we um, uh, decided to look into this, um, these asymmetries in a normal control population uh, and were able to recapitulate this by essentially uh, dividing the brain in half and subtracting one side from the next and seeing that uh, indeed we were able to capture a, an asymmetry, a larger left-sided uh, temporal planum structure. Uh, and in here, uh, plotting this out on a laterality index, looking at some right-handed controls, and non-right-handed individuals, seeing that non-right-handedness was associated with a trend, a move uh, towards uh, um, a perfect symmetry. Uh, and then looking at our semantic variants, the group that I thought was more uh, left-handed, uh, actually sort of hypothesized, well, what if maybe all of these patients were essentially left-handed? What if the right-handed individuals um, who developed semantic variant uh, were the rare individuals among uh, all groups that even though you're right-handed and you think you're right-handed, uh, you're really one of us, you're really left-handed, your brain uh, might be more symmetric. Uh, and sure enough, uh, what we saw is that uh, our right-handed semantic variants, our non-right-handed semantic variants, almost uh, indistinguishable uh, from our normal control uh, uh, left-handed individuals, uh, suggesting that maybe this finding of uh, increased amounts of non-right-handedness in the semantic variant, maybe um, uh, this was something neurodevelopmental. Um, so, um, uh, another thing about our handedness finding was um, essentially it looked like we had, you know, too much um, uh, uh, left-handedness in the semantic variant, maybe too little in the non-fluent variant, uh, and arguably uh, it was just right uh, in the logopenic variant. Um, but of course, um, uh, there's nothing just right about having a uh, logopenic variant, a, a neurodegenerative disease. Um, and so I struggled with trying to figure out what was the, the domain, what was the area of difference uh, that might explain uh, the neurodevelopmental sort of vulnerability to logopenic variant, primary progressive aphasia, and it was a, a grand rounds like this where a speaker was talking about dyslexia, showed a, a sagittal image uh, left side of the brain and where dyslexia exists in the brain, and sure enough, it was in uh, the exact region where we expect um, a logopenic variant to attack. Uh, here is looking at our cohort uh, where we divided uh, the logopenics into those that had a history of learning disability uh, versus those that didn't, uh, and having learning disability mattered. Uh, uh, the disease, the atrophy pattern was more focal. Uh, the presentation, these individuals uh, presented almost a decade uh, earlier and had greater preservation of global cognition. Um, and so then the next question was, well, you know, this neurodevelopmental finding, uh, are these just related to the language networks, the language network uh, being evolutionarily one of sort of the, the newest cognitive features that we have, um, or could neurodevelopment color or be important for all underlying neurodegenerative disorders? And so um, uh, I had found that um, uh, maybe there was a domain specificity um, uh, between the kind of learning difference that you had uh, and potentially later life vulnerability to neurodegenerative disease. Uh, and in this case, um, uh, this is a group of uh, amnestic AD individuals, uh, logopenics, uh, a larger collection than our original presentation, and uh, a large group of our posterior cortical atrophy uh, subjects. Um, purple uh, is those individuals that had a language-only learning disability, like dyslexia. Uh, the checkered pattern, individuals that happen to have something like dyslexia and maybe uh, a non-language learning disability, like dyscalculia. 
uh, you see that, that there's not much representation of learning disability in the amnestic AD population. About 25% again of our, our logopenics, almost uh, exclusively language only, and those individuals that didn't have language only had language and. Um, and then uh, in terms of the PCA individuals, um, more than half had a non-language learning disability. Uh, and again, looking at the kind of structural correlates, um, individuals with learning disability, uh, uh, primary, uh, posterior cortical atrophy, uh, seem to have um, more of a right lateralized uh, presentation. Uh, individuals with uh, PCA that didn't present uh, or possess a learning difference uh, history uh, seem to be more bilateral. Um, and then in terms of you know, whether or not uh, uh, we can sort of validate these kinds of findings. Um, well, a, a GWAS study looking at posterior cortical atrophy identified uh, three novel targets, uh, three new hits, uh, two of which have been identified to play a role in neurodevelopment. Uh, and then uh, just sort of proof of principle, uh, APOE4 has been shown to have neurodevelopmental effects that uh, babies, uh, young infants with APOE4, their brains look different. Uh, than those um, uh, without the APOE4 allele, uh, suggesting that maybe neurodevelopment could be sort of coloring uh, our neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, now we get to part two, the co-occurrence of autoimmune diseases within atypical dementias. Uh, and so again, uh, you know, we looked at uh, dyslexia, stuttering, learning disabilities. At the same time, I was looking at um, uh, uh, immune disorders in, in our populations. Uh, uh, long uh, storied history of inf inflammation in neurodegenerative diseases uh, and that um, uh, potentially being on anti-inflammatory medicines uh, might reduce your risk of, of getting one of these neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, more modern genetic uh, uh, work suggesting that uh, a lot of immune relevant genes uh, play a role in neurodegenerative diseases. In FTD and inflammation, not much was known in the time. Uh, that I was looking into this. Uh, Sjogren et al. had found that uh, there were some increased uh, elevations of TNF-alpha signaling in the CSF of uh, FTD patients. Um, in, uh, excitingly for our field, in 2006, mutations in progranulin were identified as one of the major causes of our familial FTDs. And progranulin was known at the time to have wide-ranging um, uh, effects on, on wound healing and inflammation. Uh, and, and uh, again, semantic variant uh, condition that I was really excited about, uh, the least genetic of what tend to be very genetic syndromes. And so I thought this would maybe be the best uh, disease to look into for some sort of environmental insult. Uh, and so um, uh, decided to look at autoimmune disease in this group as a sort of a marker, a cheap marker of inflammation. A uh, brief uh, primer and discussion of uh, autoimmune disease, the way that, that we were conceptualizing this, um, autoimmune diseases can cluster in families, uh, can co-occur in the same patients. Um, so you can have different kinds of spectrums of, of autoimmunity. A patient can have lupus, uh, they can have uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, they can be diagnosed with something that's essentially like rupus, something in the middle, something that suggests there's, there's clearly an autoimmune process, uh, but what exactly it is is hard to know. Um, and modern genetics uh, agree with that, that there's a lot of interrelationships uh, that you can see between the various autoimmune diseases, and this is sort of cleaning up this uh, genetic analysis figure. But uh, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, uh, celiac, Crohn's disease, there are all these interrelationships uh, between autoimmune disorders, and that um, uh, at the same time, uh, some of these relationships are uh, inversely uh, related. And so, uh, in some cases, uh, genetic risk factors that predispose you to something like rheumatoid arthritis may make you less likely to get something like thyroid disease. Uh, and again, thyroid disease was potentially identified as a, a risk factor um, in uh, FTD in the past. Um, so when we looked at uh, autoimmunity in our uh, FTD populations and controls, uh, we split the autoimmune diseases into thyroid and non-thyroid. Uh, and what you can see here in the green pie slice is the non-thyroid autoimmune diseases, uh, and they're elevated in our semantic variant uh, compared to our normal controls in our AD uh, control group, uh, listed below the types of autoimmune diseases that we found. Um, expanding on this, uh, looking at uh, progranulin, our, pro our smaller progranulin mutation cohort, we found almost the identical uh, amount of uh, non-thyroid uh, autoimmune diseases. And one of the things that was so exciting for me is when we looked at the numbers of all the autoimmune diseases, um, it, it wasn't just you know, one random occurrence of one particular uh, autoimmune disease, uh, but there seemed to be this sort of pattern, this, this sort of clustering, multiple cases of, of lupus, multiple cases of sarcoidosis, and, and so on and so forth. 
Um, and so we, we felt that they were really falling into these clusters of uh, autoimmunity um, within these FTLD TDP43 groups. Um, and so um, in the paper that uh, we put out uh, in 2013, uh, I talked about how um, uh, we were able to capture this in type A and, and type C underlying conditions or presumed underlying conditions, uh, but that it'd be really interesting to see uh, it, does this go beyond into things like type B, uh, what would C9 or F72 look like, um, and offered that they had intriguing links, uh, C9 or F72, uh, and, and the like had intriguing links to immune function. Um, at the time, the only intriguing link was I happened to look up on Google uh, C9 or F72 and TNF-alpha um, uh, the day that C9 was uh, announced um, and found an article about um, a GWAS study looking at um, rheumatoid arthritic uh, patients and their response to TNF-alpha blockers. Um, and uh, one of the hits, one of the two or three hits was uh, the C9 or F72 uh, uh, locus. Um, and so I thought this has to be uh, an immune-related gene uh, and uh, knew the answer a little bit because um, uh, I had already studied and collected these patients and saw that sure enough, uh, they also had the same percentage of these non-thyroid um, uh, autoimmune diseases. And so now this is new data, um, never been shown before uh, in a group, but uh, this is now the largest collection, uh, potentially ever, uh, at least the largest collection I've undertaken uh, with this kind of analysis. Um, unifying all of the TDP43 groups, uh, our ALS uh, spectrum and our semantic spectrum uh, uh, clinical diagnoses, our individuals that have C9, granular mutations, TARDDP, and, and seeing that, um, uh, again, this same sort of over-representation of non-thyroid uh, autoimmune diseases, always about uh, 12 to 15 percent. Um, and then, um, uh, excitingly, um, uh, here's a group of uh, PSP and MAPT carriers uh, and um, in every single comparison, uh, there's always less, uh, about 4% uh, of the tau groups um, uh, showing this um, uh, pattern of non-thyroid autoimmune disease. Uh, and then for the skeptics in the audience that say, well, uh, I don't care about the genetics, I don't care about the clinical presentation, I want the pathology. This took years to get, but um, uh, here's the, the pathological result. Uh, and again, significant, just barely, but I'll take it. And, um, uh, and when we look at the total of all of these, adding up uh, the individuals that, some individuals that had uh, ALS, FTD spectrum, C9 uh, um, uh, mutation, and type B TDP would only be counted once in here, but um, uh, overall a dramatic uh, over-representation of non-thyroid autoimmune diseases um, uh, in this uh, TDP43 group. Um, this is just the listing of all the different autoimmune diseases uh, in all the different disorders. And so you can see, obviously, that there's just such a, a greater amount of diversity uh, within the TDP43 group than the tau group, um, but also it's represented in each of the various TDP43 groups. So in C9, in granulin, in our TAR-DDP groups. Uh, always, I'm always interested in sort of outliers. And so, um, oddly enough, uh, PICS disease, uh, very few cases that we have here, but has the same sort of percentage as our uh, TDP43 cases. So, you know, is this really uh, FTLD tau driven or is it um, uh, uh, the 4R taus that are really sort of the non-thyroid uh, group? Um, so, uh, we developed this, uh, the TDP43 immune hypothesis that we see these widespread immunodysregulations across all groups with underlying TDP43 presentations. Um, is this disease causing? Uh, almost all of the cases we're looking at, the autoimmunity happened before they came to us, but not 100%, and this is important because there was a patient that I cared for, a uh, grand limitation carrier uh, originally from Italy, um, uh, and um, uh, developed um, uh, during the time that we were evaluating them, uh, I got an emergency phone call from the lab. Um, she had no white count, uh, and, uh, and so we were very, very scared, you know, where did this neutropenia come from? Uh, and we uh, had her worked up uh, by um, uh, 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 the uh, uh, hematologist and said, please look at autoimmunity as an underlying uh, potential cause. And they sort of shrugged it off until that was the answer. And so um, uh, this woman was uh, diagnosed with autoimmune neutropenia. Uh, I count that as maybe we saved her life with this hypothesis. So um, uh, please, when you see these patients, uh, consider the idea that uh, if they have some other weird findings, uh, maybe autoimmune disease could be occurring in the, the setting of their disease. Um, could autoimmunity be, be disease promoting? If it didn't start the disease, um, uh, having 
uh, expressed autoimmunity, does that hasten the disease? Um, or could it just be an epiphenomena? Even if it's just an epiphenomena, um, uh, potentially very powerful in terms of it, its abilities to serve as a biomarker uh, for disting distinguishing tau versus TDP43 uh, pathology. A whole series of uh, validations uh, since uh, closing the first cohorts, we kept seeing um, more and more of these uh, same autoimmune diseases. Uh, and then um, a lovely English study where you have uh, socialized uh, medicine, um, have these beautiful cohorts that you can look at. They, using their National Health Service database, looked at autoimmune disease uh, preceding um, uh, ALS diagnoses um, and said uh, essentially a, maybe a backhanded compliment. They said although their paper was too small to make the claims that it made, uh, we see the exact same pattern of autoimmunity uh, in our larger ALS study. Um, and uh, other validations, um, uh, knockouts of granulin, knockouts of uh, C9, uh, all are associated with autoimmunity. Um, uh, in this case, uh, four different uh, groups uh, uh, looking at loss of function C9 and its relationships uh, with various aspects of immunity. GWAS studies in FTD, um, top hits, uh, the HLA locus, so one of the most famous genes in um, inflammation and autoimmunity, uh, and then uh, potentially uh, RAB38, which uh, was exciting for me because vitiligo is one of the highest uh, um, uh, uh, hits autoimmune diseases that I find in our population, and autoantibodies to um, uh, RAB38 uh, appear in vitiligo patients, so could there be some sort of recapitulation of the uh, neurodegenerative mechanisms if you have an autoantibody to a, a particular uh, protein. Um, and then um, uh, a whole slew of uh, new mutations that uh, uh, genes that were previously only known to function uh, within the immune system uh, that are now causing uh, TDP43 disease, TBK1, very, very exciting, master regulator of NF-kappa beta signaling. Uh, but I was most excited by um, uh, the um, annexin A11 uh, result. It was, I think, uh, December 2015, and uh, um, one of my uh, uh, mentors and colleagues, Bill Seeley, was at a, a motor neuron disease meeting, uh, and he sent me a, a, a text. He said, uh, Zach, you did it again. They just announced this new gene uh, that causes um, uh, FTD, uh, ALS. Um, uh, all of its prior knowledge is understood um, in uh, the etiology pathogenesis of sarcoidosis. Again, autoantibodies to this are uh, found in, uh, prominently in, in various autoimmune diseases. Uh, I was not at the AI, AAIC um, uh, this summer, but this poster was, and I had found this online and was just in love with this. Um, uh, this is uh, our, our uh, uh, English uh, collaborators, friends that uh, run the GenFi uh, cohort, uh, and they decided to do the exact same study that, that uh, we had originally done uh, and found essentially the exact same results that the, uh, in this case, the granulin carriers had more non-thyroid um, uh, autoimmune diseases. Um, they, they didn't see uh, as much in, in their C9 group, but their C9 group was small um, and uh, uh, beautifully uh, saw very little in their MAP-T group. Um, uh, again, uh, a case of sarcoidosis, psoriasis, the same diseases over and over. Uh, one of the things that I really love about this is that I would uh, uh, entertain or hope that all of you uh, uh, would consider uh, collecting this data in the exact same way because uh, I could essentially just add this to the figures that I have before. And I think there's going to be really powerful data in figuring out are these patterns of autoimmune diseases really selective? Is, is there uh, something deeper that we can find with that? Um, uh, another example of trying to go deeper, uh, in this case, um, uh, it wasn't just that, that TDP had more autoimmune disease than tau. In this case, TDP has more than AD, uh, but the tau has less than AD. Um, and so could there be this spectrum of immunosurveillance, hyperactive immunosurveillance in TDP and maybe hypoactive in tau? And, and how would you test that hypothesis? Maybe you'd look for cancer in these groups. And so I did that years ago uh, and had seen that uh, the PSP group seemed to have more cancer. Um, was that true? Was there something in PSP that would be driving somebody towards cancer? Um, I think less and less you know, that's the case and maybe more and more it's this absence of um, this uh, increased uh, uh, immune uh, activity because uh, we, we don't see any, in any of these sub-cohorts, uh, any statistical elevations of cancer, uh, but in the total group, we still see this. Um, so I think uh, my time is, uh, is up, uh, but uh, just wanted to real briefly uh, uh, talk about uh, how I think this might be occurring, that um, uh, peripheral inflammation, innate immunity, um, there are many, many articles now coming out about um, uh, monocyte microglial activation, 
uh, that could be driven by a, a peripheral uh, increase in inflammation, um, or that uh, autoantibodies, uh, I shouldn't say or, and maybe, uh, we don't know, uh, autoantibodies, could they recapitulate uh, the genetic mechanisms of, of our diseases? Um, and we're gonna have a talk on, on uh, just that uh, uh, real shortly. Um, and so uh, just briefly run through the rest of these. We had found increased amounts of TNF-alpha in progranulin and semantic variants. Um, uh, colleagues have found that um, if you knock out uh, NF-kappa-beta TNF-alpha signaling in mice, uh, you can restore their, their functions in, in granulin mutation mice. Um, Progranulin autoantibodies were discovered in the same exact autoimmune diseases um, that we had uh, characterized, um, and that um, those progranulin autoantibodies are neutralizing. And so in this case, if you have uh, autoimmune vasculitis without a progranulin <laughs> autoantibody, you have about the normal amount of progranulin. If you have the progranulin autoantibody, you have the amount that uh, occurs in the disease population. Same thing with lupus, same thing with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and so that's the end of my talk. Uh, uh, overall, I think that there's a two-hit hypothesis for neurodegenerative disease, um, that how you're built matters and, and the life you live matter, uh, and that uh, together um, we can predict uh, uh, these sorts of diseases maybe up to uh, 50 years before they happen. And so maybe we don't need to cure if we can just prolong and delay. Uh, and so with that, uh, uh, I would say happy Thanksgiving. Uh, tomorrow is... Uh, uh, the, the U.S. holiday Thanksgiving, and so I want to give thanks to Dr. Bruce Miller, uh, Mary Lou Gorno Tempini, my co-mentors, uh, and my collaborators at uh, our various uh, distinguished uh, uh, centers. Thank you.